Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good. I'm glad that you're here. Why don't you just turn to your left and your right and just uh, give a little wave to the people around you. Let them know how happy you are to see them. And while you're doing that, I'd like to invite you to go to Scripture with us this morning. Ephesians chapter 5 is where we're going to be. Ephesians chapter 5, if you're using the Blue Bibles, you can go to page 979. 979. We've been in Ephesians chapter 5 several times, and we're back there today as we finish up this series. I'd like to welcome all of our guests that are joining us. Uh, first of all, we have guests in the house and guests that are joining us online, and people joining us online that are part of this church. Could we give all of them just a big hand and let them know how happy we are that you're with us? To join us online, you're here with us, and we're glad that you're here. I want to mention, in addition to Broad River News, um, that two weeks from today, which is uh, June the 13th, we will be celebrating our graduates, speci specifically our high school graduates. So if you have a high school graduate, if you are a high school graduate this year, um, uh, please be here on June 13th. We want to pray over you, celebrate you, and we have a really special gift uh, that we want to, to give you. I'm really happy to be joined today by Pastor Jacinta. Could you help, help make her feel welcome this morning? We're glad that she's with us. I'm glad you're with me. We're finishing up our series today called Chasing Love, Love, Sex, and Relationships in the Land of Confusion. Now, I know when I say that you often think that my titles are too wordy. Do you think this title is too wordy? Yes, it was really wordy. What would you call it if you were going to just name it something? Um, I would have just called it Love, True Love or something like that. Love, to, True Love. Marriage is what brings us together. Oh, marriage. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, that would probably uh, have been better. So go ahead. Um, so we're going to talk this final week about, uh, well, we've been talking about the importance of the church and these kind of conversations about sex, about marriage, about singleness, and um, how important it is that we take our cues from the scripture and from God and not from the world. So what we're doing today is we want to talk about um, marriage in this, in this context, not the way the culture thinks about it, but the way that the Jesus thinks about it. And so everybody's got an opinion about marriage. Sometimes they're not very good. Yeah. And so if the church doesn't give us a vision of what God intends, then we end up following the culture's lead, and we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that we're adhering to the word of Christ and letting him direct our steps. Yeah, in fact, we've been saying over the last few weeks as we set this up that we, we believe that our culture is confused. Jesus said that when we come to know the truth, the truth actually sets us free. So this series has been very much about us doing away with myths, myths about love. We tried to do a couple weeks ago uh, away with some myths about sex. Last week we focused on a few myths about single people. We affirmed last week from scripture what a blessing it is to be single and also what a blessing single people are to the church and to our lives. Today we're going to dig into the purpose of marriage and then we'll end up with, again, a few myths about marriage. If you're not married, this message is still for you. If you are married, this is especially for you. If you're between the ages of 11 and 25, we're calling you Gen Z. I didn't call you that. Somebody else did. This series is especially for you. So let's, let's jump in today with a reading from Ephesians chapter 5. And I'm just going to read it from the screens because I don't have my reading glasses. So, okay. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves him, his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are the members of his body. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to the church, to Christ and the church. Let's pray together today. Lord, thank you for gathering us in. 
uh, braving this uh, little weather that we're having this weekend. We've gathered in, and Lord, we, we've done so because we want to hear from you. We want you to lead us in God's. We want your word to come first. So I pray, Lord, that you would start with Pastor Jacinta and, and myself first. The words of our mouths and meditation of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our rock and re our redeemer. Please speak to us today in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Have you ever noticed how differently men and women talk about this movie called The Notebook? So I'll see this happen on Facebook quite a bit. Now, what I'm about to do is called stereotyping, okay? So if you don't fall within the stereotype, then you just let it go. What we call, it, back in Texas, we said like water off a duck's back, right? So if it doesn't apply to you, it doesn't apply to you. But, but often it does, I'll see generally a woman will post something like, I get to pick the movie tonight, so we are watching The Notebook for the 932nd time, right? And then a little bit later, there will be a post from the male in the relationship, usually with a sad face emoji, saying, we're watching The Notebook again, right? This is, this is kind of how it goes. So it's, it's an older movie at this point. Uh, it's a very popular movie still. Ryan Gosling, Rachel McAdams are this young couple who fall in love in the 1940s, and the narrator of the movie is an elderly man who is reading uh, the story of these two young lovers from a notebook to a woman in a modern-day assisted living facility. At the end of the movie, we find out that the woman in nursing care is actually his wife. She she is struggling with dementia, and he's reading to her because it triggers her memory, and the couple ends up dying in each other's arms with one final memory of their love. Spoiler alert, by the way. I should have said that before. If you haven't seen it, it's been 20 years, okay? It's on you if you haven't seen it, all right? I'm not saying... Also, at the end of Gone with the Wind, uh, there's a curse word, okay? Also, at the end of Gone with the Wind, okay? So, uh, it's a long, it, it's, it's this crazy romantic and sad and heart-rending movie. It's got some really great themes in it, like the importance of following through on the vow to love someone in sickness and in health. But it's also got some things in it that I think Christians should take some pause about if we want to think about marriage the way that God intends it. So we're not going to dig too deep in on this particular point, but there is this soulmate view of marriage which is presented, and I, by the way, I don't think that the idea of soulmate is something that God is opposed to, but the way that it's presented in this movie, and oftentimes in a movie, is this, it's just this deep emotional intensity that two people have for one another. Now, again, I'm not opposed to the idea of a soulmate. I believe that I found my soulmate with, with Pastor Jacinta. I, I saw a, a really great message last week actually Antoinette sent me about Christian soulmates but this idea is not quite right that if you can just find a partner right your soulmate then your life then your life will be filled with passion and meaning so I said last week that marriage is about other things not just it's about what procreation it's about often about parenting check it our society is built on strong marriages but this view this romantic passionate uh, no emotional connection says that no marriage is just about finding that one romantic partner that you were destined to be with this this view would say that's how you find happiness now I happen to know that that is how you found happiness <laughs> Uh, tried it. I couldn't even say it with a straight face. But is this, is this really a realistic version of marriage? No, it's, it's not a realistic version. You could have paused. Like, take a pause. <laughs> you should have been like, ah, uh, no. Say, no. <laughs> no. Uh, the reason that we resonate with the, no the notebook, and I'll have to say that um, we break the stereotypes, because I'm more of like Rambo in Raiders of the Lost Ark like The Fifth Element, those right. kind of movies. Kevin's more about The Notebook, so he's probably seen The Notebook 900 times. I've no, never I seen haven't. It. I've never seen, seen it like the twice. Movie. I've never seen it, so maybe I need to watch it today, but I'm not into sappy love stories. I like a little action with my movie. But everybody wants that really deep and everlasting kind of love, but is that what we should be waiting for? Right. We want love to come in and kind of swoop us up and we just faint like, ah, oh, and everything's just like little cherubs above us and that sort of thing. So we want this emotional intensity and we think that that, that will carry us through life. But of course, our marriage is gonna have passion in it. Mm -hmm. We want that. I love Kevin, he loves me. And I was thinking that he would probably do something like that, like read to me 
if I were in assisted living, Aww. you would probably read to me um, out of a notebook. Yes, I would. But we're passionate about our relationship with one another. We, we love each other. We enjoy spending time together. Um, we're best friends. But if we only relied on that emotional intensity that we see in the movies like The Notebook, our marriage would have ended a long time ago. True. We would not be together. Um, yesterday, I got a little upset with Pastor Kevin. I went to get my hair done, and he said, I'll drive you. I've got to run an errand. And so I said, you know, I'll be this certain time. And I got done early, but when I came out, he wasn't there waiting for me. And it was raining, and I was really mad. And I was like, I had to wait 15 minutes for you to come pick me up. So I was really angry. And I, I know remember. I know that sounds silly. But I was like, where did you go? Why weren't you here when it was time to pick me up? So if we rely just exactly on how we feel every day, if we're not feeling particularly lovey-dovey towards that person, then what do we have if we're just depending on emotions? So here's the danger in the notebook's version of marriage, the idea that if your life isn't filled with passion and meaning, that your spouse might not be your soulmate. Right. And if you don't feel love for your spouse, mm -hmm. then you must have picked the wrong one, and it's time to go looking for another one. So a lot of marriages go off the rails because of feelings. We don't feel a certain way. And the reality is that marriage involves times when you may not feel love for your spouse. Like, I wasn't feeling lovey-dovey yesterday to Kevin. I was, I was feeling angry. But if you want a marriage that lasts and goes deep, you choose to love your spouse no matter how you feel. The feeling part. When we're performing wedding ceremonies, Kevin often uses the idea of two different stories that are being written separately. And then they come together as one story, and it's kind of like weaving two stories together. And it takes time and work and effort. If you think being married is just going to be love, then let me just disabuse you of that notion. It's a lot of hard work being married. Weaving two stories together, weaving two people together takes a lot of hard work, and it doesn't happen just by itself. But when we commit that we're going to love each other, no matter how we feel, what the feeling is right now, then we're in a position to build a meaningful marriage that fulfills God's purpose for marriage. That's good. So it's not just about feelings. And believe me, I have a lot of deep emotional feelings for you. It, but it's not just that. It's not just about finding your soul made in some intensely emotional way. If it's not those things, then what is the purpose of marriage? We've said God has a design for marriage. We've been going in and out of this actually from the very first week over the last few weeks. And by the way, if you haven't seen the first three weeks of this series, I really suggest you go back and look at them. Facebook and YouTube or have both of those. Um, we said a couple of weeks ago that Jesus has a sexual ethic. But listen, Jesus also has a design for our marriages. God invented the idea. So what is marriage for? Let me just remind you scripturally of two really important things that we've already seen. First of all, from Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, it says, so God created man in his own image, and the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And then, taking this as a cue in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31, this early church leader named Paul Paul said it this way. He said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. If you're taking notes today, and I really recommend that you do, if you've got a connect card there, especially if you're married or wish to be married or know someone who is married. Did I care, everybody? Okay, good. I'd love for you to write down, we're going to do this very quickly, seven things that I think we can learn. We're going to do very fast uh, about God's design for marriage. First of all, marriage involves partners of equal value. This is important. It's pretty ironic because people like to say, if you hear people criticizing the church or criticizing the Bible, they'll often say that the Bible, you know, the Bible has old-fashioned ideas about women. You'll even hear people say that the, the Bible is misogynistic and it doesn't value women. But very interestingly, if you compare, and you should do this on your own time, compare the creation story in the Bible to other ancient creation stories, what you're going to find out is that it's the Bible who considers women to have equal value value to men. This was a radical idea in the ancient world. Get this, the Bible begins with this proclamation that both men and women, get it, are equal image bearers of God. That's important. 
You might have noticed that in, in Genesis. God created both male and female in his image. Well, yeah, pastor, but the, the Bible also says that Eve was just Adam's helper. That's what they said. He was just, this word helper, it's, it's important. Words are important, and I might mispronounce the, the word, but the, the, this Hebrew word is the Hebrew word easier, this word helper. And there is nothing secondary or inferior about the word easier from the Hebrew. In fact, the Bible uses the same word for God all of the time, including in Psalm 30, verse 10, where it says, Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. Watch this. Here comes the same word helper. O Lord, be my helper helper. Do we believe that saying something inferior or secondary about God? No, of course not. There's nothing there. Let's tell us something else about God's design for marriage. So marriage is meant to be permanent. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say it that way, permanent, it sounds really, really depressing, right? But marriage is meant to be permanent. We're supposed to stay together. We're supposed to love each other through the hard times. And did you notice that in the verse in Ephesians that a man is to love his father and mother and hold fast to his wife? And I hate saying Hebrew words when Sharon's here because I know I'm saying them wrong. But the Hebrew word for hold is debak, which carries the idea of coming together or sticking together as one. And so many songs, they say, love lasts forever. I'll love you forever. This idea is written on our hearts and it's part of our design. We crave that, right? We want that love, that we want that romantic partner. We want to have that, and that's God's design for us, that we're permanently with our partner. And marriage is a sexually com complementary institution. Yeah. So according to Genesis, God designed males and females to complement each other. Men and women are equal as people, but different in their biology. And so marriage is not just an institution of any two people, but of two people of the opposite sex. So marriage, third, is a sexually complementary institution. Number four, get this, marriage is about procreation. I'm not going to spend time because we've gone over this, but sex is designed to be experienced in the context of marriage. Now, I know that's not what you've heard. I know that even right now as I'm saying that, many of you are disagreeing with me, but that is clearly what God's Word says. No amens equals awesome. <laughs> right? That's how we were designed. So a major purpose of marriage is procreation. That's how God designed us so that we could multiply and fill the earth. I just read an article last week, and you should check this out. Just Google New York Times declining birth rates. This, this article is incredible, talking about that because of declining birth rates, we have major issues coming to our entire world. In every country or every continent, with one exception, within the next 50 years, we will have a major crisis. Why? Because we don't do what God said to do. What do you say? Male and female come together. They are one. They multiply and they replenish and subdue the earth. Marriage is about procreation. Here's another one. Marriage is about companionship, right? G Genesis says that married couples become one flesh. Now get this, that's one spiritually, that's one physically, that's one emotionally, that's one relationally. I read recently that millennials are more likely than anyone ever to be something, in fact a new term I'd never heard before, which we're going to hear more, they're, 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 they're going to be called something like married singles. Get this. These are people that, that get married for various reasons, for various conveniences, but they intend to continue living on, kind of living separate lives. This is their intention when they get married, right? You go your way, I'll go my way. You've got your friends, I've got my friends. You've got your money, I've got, your, got my money. Listen, this is outside of God's plans. I'm not saying that people can't have separate friends. I'm not saying you can't have separate bank accounts. But the idea that we live separate lives while being married is outside of God's plan. Are you hearing this this morning? You're hearing me? All right, all right. I want to make sure. Y'all looking at me, my dad said, like a cow looks at a new gate. <laughs> right? So, all right. We're, we're good. We're good. I'm not saying you look like cows. That was not the point. It was about... It was about the gate part. That was the, uh, you, okay, you, you, you got it. And by the way, you know, let me just say this too, as we're going on, it, it, outside of my notes here, is that I understand that as I look across this room today, that there's so many people in so many different situations, right? People that, that have struggled, and, and, and maybe, maybe it's people that have, have divorced, and maybe it's your second marriage or your third marriage. We have people that, as we're talking that, about male and female, all this, people that would say, you know what? I, 
as I'm hearing this, it, do, do, this, is, this is not how my life has gone. And I want you to hear very clearly this morning. The Bible says that for those people who are in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation. What, is, what does that mean for you? That means that it doesn't matter how you arrived at this place. When you give yourself and you give your heart to Jesus, when you say, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life, he redeems everything from the past and every good thing that God has promised to me and to Pastor Jacinta, he has promised to you. Do you believe that this morning? That's, a, that's important. Listen, if you hear anything today that sounds like bad news, I want you to know that it's not coming from the Scripture. It's coming from somebody else that wants to get in your ear and ruin what you're learning, okay, and ruin where you're going. Okay, that was, that was for free. That was for free, okay. Uh, marriage about companionship. Marriage is meant to be monogamous. So old-fashioned, I know. This, listen, this again, the, the idea of monogamy when the Scripture was written was a radical before-its-time concept just like it kind of is right now, right? It's a radical concept even right now. What is this concept? Monogamy, it's men and women leaving their mothers and fathers' household. They're creating a new household together. You can see that when you read the Bible that there are consequences of not following God's plan for marriage that involves one man and one woman. Why don't you finish this up? So marriage is good. So it is good, and God puts marriages in place before the fall of man and before sin enters the world, and God says marriage is very good. And I think that we need to know these things to understand why God designed marriage, but what is God's purpose for marriage? What is, what is he actually trying to do? Why does marriage matter for our culture? Why does marriage matter in the church? And if you're taking notes, I want to give you three specific purposes of marriage for the culture and for the church. And firstly, Kevin hinted at this already, but write this down. God designed marriage to portray his love for the church. In the Old Testament, God used marriage as a metaphor. And he described his relationship with this to Israel. It was God and Israel, and, they, and he used it like a marriage relationship. And God said, I don't want to just have a legal contract with you. I want a covenant. Right. I want something that's based on love. And marriage is that, that's what it's like. When they were unfaithful to him, he compared it to marriage. You can find illustrations all in the Old Testament about that. But the New Testament marriage between a man and a woman shows how Christ and his church come together. Look again in Ephesians 5 and see how Paul makes it clear. Let's read verse 31 and 32 again. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to the church to Christ and the church. So everything we do in marriage matters. Being faithful to your spouse matters because in unfaithful marriages, especially in the church, this distorts how people view Christ's love for the church. Secondly, God designed marriage, and I love this, to give a picture of his relational character. So, so help me out this morning, get this. How many gods do followers of Christ believe in? How many gods? One God, right? One, right? But we also believe that God exists as three distinct persons. We call it the mystery of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Get this, one God, but three persons who share in this divine nature. So get this, God is relational in his very nature. Are you seeing how this matters for marriage? Because in marriage, we have two distinct persons persons, a husband and a wife, who come together in relational unity. It says they shall become one flesh. They become one family unit. Get this, you don't lose your distinctness in marriage. I've heard people argue against marriage this way. They say, I'm not giving myself up, right? I'm my own person. I'm not going to become one flesh with any. The Bible never talks about in any way. Listen, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, there's a lot of distinctness there, right? But they share in one nature. You don't lose your distinctness when you come into marriage. You are still you. In fact, it's, it's awesome because you get the opportunity to be something greater than you are by yourself. That's number two. God designed marriage to give a picture of his relational character. Here's the final one. God designed marriage for the flourishing of children and the benefit of of society. I'm going I'm, I'm to say something 
that isn't politically correct here, and if it makes you mad, you can tell me later, and I want you to, if you, if you want to tell me later, right? The truth is that kids do best when they live in a home with a mom and dad who love each other. Listen, they are less likely to drop out of school. They are less likely to abuse drugs and alcohol. They are less likely to attempt suicide. I'm not talking Bible right now. I'm talking science. Go look at the, go look at the statistics. They are less likely to be in poverty. I'm saying this fully knowing that we have lots of families in here that aren't in this situation. So am I saying to you that God isn't going to bless you and your children? No, in fact having pastored for a bunch of years now, I believe that God has a special grace that he gives to single moms and a special grace that he gives. Listen, these people are my heroes. Knowing how hard it was to raise two kids with the two of us, three kids. <laughs> Sheridan gets on my nerves sometimes, so it's just, no, she's not in here. Alexis, there's a seat right up here. Come on, come on, sit down. You've got lots of, lots of chairs right there. Right? I'm saying that, no, the, 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 he has, God has, if you're not in the situation of having a mom and dad in the home, God has great things for you and your kids and you as a parent. But I want to stay on this, this truth train for a second, okay? The choo-choo truth chain is coming to the station, right? Children without a mom and dad in the home are at increased risk for health problems and academic problems and emotional and behavioral problems. Are there kids that go against this trend? Of course, but the evidence is that kids do better when they are in a home with a mom and dad who love each other. So since I'm already in trouble, I'll just double down here, okay? This series is ending. We can act like it didn't happen if you didn't like it, all right? So our government has a primary responsibility of helping create and foster a healthy society. So since this is so clear, what we've just said, our government should be interested in supporting a monogamous, lifelong vision of marriage. There, you got me to say something political. I'll blame you, okay? For, for a long time, sociologists thought that the connection between a mother, the connection to a mother was the most important thing for a child. But now, if you read sociologists, they'll say that both matter deeply, both a connection to a mother and a father. I love the way that the author Paul Rayburn said it. He said, enough is known about the positive impact of father's presence on children's lives that government should start changing public policies to encourage fathers to spend time with their children. I, I believe that. I believe that. Here's, here's the bottom line about marriage. Everybody ready? You're going to get the bottom line, right? Everybody ready? Okay, here it is. Marriage is not about you. I'm sorry, but the notebook version of marriage, it's not about you finding your, your soulmate, and that's the secret to a meaningful life. There is something bigger going on with marriage. It's about sacrificing. It's about sacrificing for your spouse. It's about sacrificing for your children. It's about putting God's loving character on display for the church to see. And listen, not just for the church to see, for the whole world to see. Hey, hey, everybody, this is what God looks like. When you look at our marriage, this is what God looks like. It's not about you. It's not about me. Marriage is about God's kingdom. This church, Broad River Church, has a vision for those of you who are married and those who think that they will be someday. When you and your spouse commit your marriage to a greater purpose, you are going to experience the beauty and richness of marriage just like God des designed it to be. Does anybody believe that today? Now, we've done myths every week, right? Yeah, we've done myths every week, and we did last week. What, what was the myth that we did about sex last week? Two weeks ago, sex. Oh, two uh, weeks. One of the myths, sex is not a big deal. Myth, sex is a big deal. Yeah. Okay. And then we also, last week, we did myths about being single, and what was one of those myths? Being single means no family. It's mm -hmm. a myth. Yeah. And so we're going to do some myths about marriage this morning before we pray and end. And I'll start. Myth number one is that marriage will fulfill your ultimate relational needs. Myth. Myth. Everybody say myth. So we've seen this in pastors. Young people will come and say, I want to get married because this is going to bring fulfillment and joy to my life if I invest in this other person. 
and they get married and they realize, oh, this didn't quite work out. This person is not fulfilling me like I need to be fulfilled and I don't find it. So we should have a kid and that will help. I'll find joy if I have a kid. And so they have a kid and then all of a sudden that doesn't help either and they're still not fulfilled. And they say, well, that didn't work. We should probably have a second child. And they have a second child and they're still not fulfilled in marriage. And then they just say, but what seems to be missing is whether or not we should be looking at our marriage and family to fulfill the ultimate relational needs. I love Kevin dearly. He loves me. We're best friends. We were playing a game the other day. Sheridan likes to make up games and we're playing a game and she's like, who's your best friend? And we both said, mommy and daddy, you know, we're the best friends. But he ultimately, I can't find my fulfillment in Kevin. I can't, he doesn't, he can't make me happy. He can't give me joy. He can't fulfill my relationship with Christ. I have to fulfill that through Jesus Christ. I have to have relationships with other people. Kevin is not the end all and be all to what I am as a person. My relational needs are met by Jesus Christ. And then he's just an extra benefit. Or well, I think I'm better than that, but. Well, or sometimes he's just the guy that makes me angry, but. I'm your side chick, it sounds you're like. You're my sidekick, side right. chick, yeah. yeah. So what seems to be missing is that we shouldn't do that. And we talk about, I was thinking about Morpheus from the Matrix. And you know, he's looking for the one. And we're always like, oh, I gotta find the one, the one person. And if you're thinking you'll be married someday, do you want your future spouse to look to you to fulfill their greatest relational needs? What a burden. Who could do that? Have you ever met you? <laughs> Have I ever met myself when I get dumped off and I'm left without a car? How angry I got for no reason? Have you met yourself? Christopher West said it this way, if we look to another human person as our ultimate fulfillment, we will crush them. Isn't that crazy? If you desire your husband or wife to be the person who fulfills you, you will crush them. You'll crush their spirit. You'll crush their life. I think that's such a good quote. And let me repeat something that Kevin said a few weeks back. Um, we love each other. We're blessing. We're passionate about our marriage. We're passionate about our kids. But I'm looking beyond my immediate family to God and to the church and to other friends for my ultimate relationships for my fulfillment. One of the reasons that married people experience so much loneliness inside the marriage is because there's this expectation that their spouse is gonna fulfill their needs. And so they don't work at developing other relationships. And then they decide to leave the marriage to keep looking for their soulmate because this person doesn't make them feel a certain way. That's good. I want, I want to go back to Jesus one more time. We talked about him last week. We were talking about singleness. But Jesus was never married on earth but he lived the most relationally fulfilled life ever. Single, but with an intimate relationship with God and his friends and his disciples. Watch this. Marriage is one way to experience intimacy in relationship, but it's not the only way. Here's a second myth. Marriage will get rid of your sin. Myth and LOL. <laughs> I... In fact, I would say anything that you're experiencing that manifests a sin in your life after you get married will not become easier to deal with. It'll become more difficult. I've met a lot of young men who are addicted to pornography before they get married, and they're convinced that once they get to experience the real thing in marriage on a regular basis, they won't be addicted anymore. I've seen them marry beautiful young women inside and out, and then they're surprised to find out later that they still have a porn habit even right after their marriage starts. In fact, many times it gets worse. And then often that beautiful young woman will, will discover the habit inside of her mate and then blame themselves. Well, maybe if I had become more attractive, then he wouldn't have had this problem. When the truth is, it has nothing to do with her attractiveness and beauty. I'm going to start preaching right here at the end, if that's all right, okay? It has everything to do with the stronghold that's of sin that is on his life. She's not the problem in this situation. He is. Are you seeing this? He brought this bad boy into the marriage. 
And then a lot of these marriages sadly end up in, in divorce. They have a hard time getting through those things and mending these things up. The good news is, and I, I want you to hear the good news today, is that God, even those situations, no matter what it is, God transforms marriages. He brings grace and healing to couples like that. God can heal. We've seen it. God can heal even the most shattered marriages. That's good news, right? But if you expect your marriage to remove selfishness or greed or pride or lust, you're going to be disappointed. Listen, you were a sinner before you got married, and you will continue to be a sinner after you get married. We bring our sinful selves into all of our relationships, and that includes our marriages. And obviously this is not an excuse to keep on sinning but it's just a recognition of why marriage can be so difficult. And the Holy Spirit transforms believers to be more like Christ in this life, but our sinful nature continues to weaken us until the next life, so we have to deal with it. When there is confession and honesty and grace, marriage can be a powerful place for healing and spiritual growth, but it won't get rid of your sin on its own. So I think, do we have one more myth? We do have one more myth, but it's too spicy for Sunday morning, right? The third myth is that married sex is boring, okay? But we're not doing that this morning, okay? We're not doing that myth. This, we're not doing that. It's, it's a myth. It's too much for Sunday morning. So we're just going to call it a myth and pray and be done. Here, here's what I want to say as we're closing today. And I've already talked about it a little bit, but I want everybody to hear this, is that our ability to talk about what it looks like for us to have success in our marriage and to prosper in our marriage and, and to, to overcome even the most difficult things is not because we find a way to be strong enough our own and that we have the willpower to make it. It was based on our will power we also would not have made it right our ability to do this is by looking we saw it in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 32 he says the mystery is profound and then Paul he's talking about marriage and he says right at the very end he says by the way what I'm talking about is Christ and his church Right? Why can we have this prosper? Why can we prosper and have success in marriage? Because Christ has done the work. He's given us the model. He He came, and and regardless of what we had done, in fact, in spite of what we've done, He says, "I'm going to give everything." We often say, and I'm counseling with people that marriage is not a 50-50 thing. Why, why do we say that? Because we don't see that in our relationship with Jesus. Listen, Jesus did all the work. He did everything. He came all the way. And so I, I want, as we're ending today, I, I want you to, to think about the fact that this all ties back to, the, to this idea that Jesus came and lived a perfect life and laid down his life for you and me, was buried and resurrected. We call it the gospel. We call it good news. And it's the only reason we can have good news when we talk about something like this. Because listen, being married can be hard. But because of what Jesus has done, and, and that's where I want us to end today. In fact, just all over this building, wherever you are, if you just close your eyes, I want to pray with you and for you. Lord, thank you for your words of truth to us this morning. Lord, thank you that you have clear direction for us. Thank you, Lord, that even the most shattered marriages Lord many over and over again we've seen you do amazing things so I pray for marriages in this place that as as we've been talking there's there's people that say you know we got some work to do there's some husbands who have some uh, some things to say to their wives and wives that have some things to say to their husbands and I just pray Lord that you would give us a, a humble spirit as we approach each other but I pray for those who are considering being married, especially younger people, Lord, that you would give them a biblical view, give them a, a view that comes from you of what Scripture says about what it looks like to be married. Lord, let us not take our cues from a culture that is confused and off the rails. Lord, help us not to take, follow the example of a culture that just doesn't have any idea how to do it. Lord, I pray for 
those that are here today that would say, you know what, I, I, I was married and I'm not anymore and I, we were divorced. And, and, and I pray that in this moment right now, God, that they would, they would feel the, the, the strength and the joy of the Lord, that in you there is no condemnation, that, that you're taking them th from this day and that you're moving them forward, that you have great things for them and their lives. Not a spirit of fear, not a spirit of, of condemnation, but a spirit of joy and peace. And God, as, as I'm praying, I just feel like there's, there's people in this room today that would say, you know what, I've never even put first things first. I've never even made Jesus the, the leader and the ruler of my life. And as we were singing or as I was speaking, as we were speaking this morning, there's just something kind of tugging on your heart. You feel that God is, is calling you to make a step this morning, a new step. And if that's you this morning, nobody's looking around right now. I want to say a prayer that I'd like you to repeat after me. And these are words that I'm going to say, but I want you to say them from your heart this morning. Maybe for the first time or maybe for the first time in a long time. And I'd like to know who I'm praying with this morning. So while nobody's looking around, if this is you and you'd, you'd like to say, I, I want to pray a prayer and make a decision to follow Jesus this morning. If that's you, would you just lift your hand where you are? all over this room thank you Jesus yes Lord amen you can put your hands down I just want to wait another moment anybody else that would want to put their hand up to say I, I want to make this decision today thank you Jesus thank you for this holy moment Lord this is just a moment between you and God Broad River Church, nobody prays alone, so I'm going to say these words. Would you just pray along with me and those that are praying this for the first time or maybe for the first time in a long time? Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for coming for me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for the new life that I have in you. And now I give you my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Turn my heart back to you. I want to live my life for you. I love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Even talking about something like this, God's done an amazing work in people's lives this morning. Can we just give God praise for what he's done this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, give him a big praise. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus.